Hello and welcome to Verbal to Visual. I'm Doug Neal. I'm in a new space today and I thought I'd share a video that's a little bit different in format than what I typically have made on this channel here. I've experimented with lots of styles of videos over the years. Today I'm going with a low editing analog approach, a poster paper up on the wall, a marker, and a book. This one. The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. I've been reading this book over the past couple of weeks. I read a chapter this morning and I wanted to share one of the interesting ideas from it, which is this one right here, the end of history illusion. So what I'd like to do is kind of read from the book, the main concept, sketch it out, and then talk about it for a little bit. So if you're in the mood for a slightly slower paced style of video as if you were in the office chatting with me uh, as opposed to a more produced sped up narration edited style of video it's not going to be that today it's going to be this so if that sounds good to you hang out for a bit here's the idea the this is from chapter 14 of the book called you'll change um, and by the way, the psychology of money is timeless lessons on wealth, greed, and happiness. Uh, 20 short chapters. It's part of a sketch note book club that I'm doing right now and has been the easiest of the three books that we have explored in three months of book clubs. We started with Atlas of the Heart, then went to Thinking Fast and Slow. Now we're on the psychology of money, which is the thinnest of the three. And it's nice because it's kind of short, punchy chapters, each of which has kind of one big idea or a couple of big ideas to it. Uh, the end of history illusion was kind of one of the, the sub ideas or within this chapter. And the idea is it's the tendency for people to be keenly aware of how much they've changed in the past but to underestimate how much their personalities, desires, and goals are likely to change in the future. So the end of history illusion being that, you know, you get to you get to one point, you know that a bunch of changes have happened in the past, but you think that you're not going to change going into the future, and that's part of how you plan. That's the idea. Here's how I would sketch it out. By the way, I did, you know, this is this is my first stage sketch notes. Uh, when I was reading this chapter this morning um, and what I sketch up here isn't going to be perfect it's not going to be polished it's part of why I want to experiment with this format a little bit to encourage you to be a little bit rougher with the sketches that you create and not worry about making them pretty just try to create a useful visual a useful visual artifact for yourself and perhaps the other people that you work with uh, so there, there's a core shape to this one that made sense to me that looks a bit like this. So we'll use this as a line to describe the arc of history if you want. Um, the y-axis doesn't really mean anything. Up is not good, down is not bad. It's just to represent that throughout life we change. Our personalities change, our desires change, our life circumstances change. So what this represents right here is right now. Um, this is where we are, where you are, where I am. Uh, it's not a static place. There's still moving forward um, you don't know what's going to happen in the future sometimes you think you do or uh, as you're planning if you're planning your finances planning your career planning family life whatever it is uh, we do a lot of imagining what will make us happy in the future what things will be like in the future and that influences our decisions that we make today uh, and the reason I like this idea so much is that it just highlights how um, kind of silly it is to think that, to be overconfident in our estimates that we make today about what's going to happen in the future. It's kind of a common theme with uh, one of the core principles from thinking fast and slow, is that we tend to be overconfident in our um, 
evaluations of like why things happened in the past and overconfident in our predictions about what will happen in the future. So I suppose one thing that we can add to this diagram here, in some ways I like it just like this. Uh, I feel like sometimes when you start to add too many words or too many other things to uh, like a core shape or a core diagram that makes sense to you, it kind of dilutes its power. Um, so I'm gonna add some things to this sketch. We'll see if it dilutes its power for, for you, its meaning, if it has meaning. Um, one thing we might do here is just kind of label this to say that the future's not gonna look like this. I'm trying to decide if I wanna add that label up here or down here. Doesn't really matter. By the way, I'm in an office space in downtown Portland, so you might hear some city noises outside or some office noises around me. Hope that's not a distraction. I kind of like it. I'm not in a basement windowless office, which is where I've spent a couple of different stages of my creative career making videos here. So we know that the future won't look like this. That, by the way, is kind of where the title, the, the name of this idea comes from. It's like the illusion that, oh, history is gonna stop right now. Things are gonna stay steady so that my analysis, my study of the past is going to correctly, or it's gonna allow me to correctly predict the future. Um, and while there are general lessons that can be learned from past events, uh, one of the traps that you can fall into is thinking that the, the highs and lows, um, the extreme events that have been observed in the past, that as you're thinking about the future, you're not, uh, it would be wrong to assume that events are gonna stay within those bounds. I think this also came up in thinking fast and slow, uh, perhaps in the realm of like disaster prep, if you're thinking about, um, you know, floods have happened in your area. There's some sort of a high water mark that shows the highest a flood has ever gotten. Um, if you do your planning under the assumption that it's never gonna get past that high water mark, which is how sometimes we plan things, eventually that's gonna be wrong. Eventually there will be a flood that reaches a level that's higher than that. Uh, and I think one way that that can show up on a depiction like this is maybe looking at the largest spread like, uh, if we go maybe from there to there, to a little bit of an arrow, even just thinking about how your own personality or life circumstances changed, like the largest, the largest ship there has ever been has been of this size here. So even if you recognize that you're gonna change in the future, you might think, okay, I'll change, but I'm never gonna change more than this. I think that's a false assumption. So maybe we'll call this something like the high watermark fallacy. That might already have a name, I don't know if that's it or close to it, but that's what we'll call it for the purposes of this video at least. Uh, so recognizing the shifts might be larger than they've been in the past. Um, Morgan Housel within this chapter on the concept that you'll change, the subtitle of the chapter is, long-term planning is harder than it sounds, harder than it seems because people's goals and desires change over time. So acknowledging that your goals and desires and life circumstances will change over time as it relates to your financial planning. Uh, so just accounting for that. And the discussion of sunk cost comes into play here. Let me actually read the, the definition of sunk cost was helpful to me, which I've heard before, um, but kind of never hadn't quite sunk in, pun intended. Sunk costs, anchoring decisions to past efforts that can't be refunded. 
are a devil in a world where people change over time. So one example of this maybe is you go to school, you get a degree in uh, journalism, let's say, and you do that. You go become a reporter, a news anchor, or something like that. Uh, you put money into getting that degree. Let's say you enter that career and you hate it. Uh, you try a bunch of different ways of trying to make a career work in that field. None of them you like. Uh, and you want to try something different. But sunk costs would kind of imply or create the feeling that, man, you put time and money into that degree. You've put time and money into your career so far in that field. Um, and sunk costs is when you let those past investments that you can't do anything about anymore dictate your decisions moving forward. So because you put those that time and energy in, uh, there's this weight that feels like you have to stay in that career, in that field, even if you don't like it. Uh, if it makes you unhappy and your life is not satisfying, those sunk costs kind of anchor you <laughs> in that place, as crummy as that sounds. So I think where that might show up on a diagram like this is imagining, um, uh, let's see, where is our shift going on? So like. Uh, let's say, you know, there were some set of circumstances that led you to this point right here. And, you know, maybe this, this is the, t the time and energy and money that you invested to get to this particular place. And if you let some costs do their thing, that would <laughs> encourage you to stay here. That would like lock you in to uh, this particular path. I'll kind of make it bold just to show that you're like locked in. If you allow some costs to kind of do their thing or dictate your decisions, then you would kind of be locked into this life path, even if it wasn't satisfying um, because of the energy and resources that you put into getting to this particular place. So let's just label this as Sunk costs. Um, let's just say, like, locking in your life trajectory. Part of the reason I wanted to like make a video about this this morning, the day after I moved into this new office, is that I think um, my career and even like specifically the spaces that I have been in over the past decade since I've been exploring the world of visual thinking have shifted so much. Uh, my life circumstances have shifted so much. When I started Verbal to Visual a decade ago, I was living with my parents. So like in my bedroom, in my parents' house is where the very first videos on this channel were recorded. Um, I moved from there in with some friends into a basement, made some videos there, moved into an apartment with a friend, made videos in my bedroom in that apartment, moved into a studio space that was all my own, made videos there, tried van life for a little bit, made a couple videos in my van and on location. Uh, met a girl, I had actually met her a while ago, but started dating a girl, eventually moved in, started making videos in a home office that wasn't my bedroom. We got married, bought a house, moved to a basement office, had kids, got kind of broke for a little bit, still kind of broke but have enough resources to experiment with, okay, now I think it would be beneficial for me to have a space outside of the home where I can come to make the style of videos that I'm most interested in making. Uh, but I gotta I got recognize that that will change in the future. This style of video is one that I'm experimenting with. I might continue to make this style of video for a while. This space is well set up for it. I might want to teach, teach workshops in this style part of why I want to try to get good at this. Um, 
So far, day two, I enjoy having a bit of a commute to get here and a place where I can leave work in the office, go home and focus more exclusively on family time when I'm at home. So there are ups and downs and specific things that led me to being in this particular space, doing this particular type of work that I am enjoying so far as I make this video. Um, so I'm gonna, you know, stick here for a while, stick where I am, but it is helpful for me to acknowledge that undoubtedly things will change this office won't serve my needs forever. This style of video probably won't serve my needs forever. Uh, and I think those types of reminders are helpful to not get us locked in to things that no longer serve us. Um, so I'm saying that as a reminder to my future self as much as I'm saying it to you. And I think this, this concept of the end of history illusion just has a, has a lot to say about all that and kind of helps to show why it's silly to lock yourself in or to think that you can't change because of what you put in to get to where you are. That change is a constant. That is what the, the study of history tells us. And here's where the irony comes in. People who study history know that. And yet, it's so easy to make predictions about the future that are limited to what's happened in the past. New things happen that have never happened before every single day, and that will continue to be the case. History has not ended. This arc will continue to go up and down. It will undoubtedly go up and below the, uh, above and below at these points at some point. So keep that in mind. As it relates to your financial life and your investing life. This book is a little bit more about investing than I thought it would be. Much of it is kind of like mindset um, around financial decisions, which is very helpful. Um, but the, the key takeaway from this chapter is around moderation. As you consider career decisions, financial decisions, uh, try to avoid the extremes. So, you know, Aim for moderate annual savings, moderate free time, no more than a moderate commute to get to your place of work. To get here, it takes me um, maybe 12 minutes when there's no traffic, up to maybe 20 when there is. That feels moderate, for now at least. I also get to cross a river. Uh, I live on the east side of Portland. Downtown Portland is on the west side of the Willamette River. And again, I'm two days into being in this space, but it's fun to cross a river, to go over a bridge, and even to go from like the quiet east side of Portland over to the big buildings of the west side. That's kind of a fun transition. Uh, for now, I'm sure there will be some days when that commute becomes annoying, but there's also some positives to it. And it feels moderate enough, even in heavy traffic, I think. Uh, and, uh, making sure to spend at least moderate time with your family. So there's a bit of uh, moderation involved here that stem from the acknowledgement that you will change in the future. So like to make an extreme decision, often that can be anchored in the idea that um, whatever surrounding that decision, whatever that uh, decision will allow for that you're gonna like it and enjoy being in that place for a long time the fact that this is going up and down shows you that that you're probably not so like that extreme decision uh, you might come to regret I think that's as much as I want to talk about this idea today thank you for watching this video I hope it was interesting for you to see and hear and think through these ideas yourself uh, if sketching out ideas is something that you too are interested in doing, that is a skill that I teach. Uh, you can learn more about the various uh, teaching and learning opportunities at verbaltovisual.com. Thanks for watching this video. I look forward to making another one sometime soon. See you then.